Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast that's had Paul Hirsch on three times, and he keeps getting better, I would say. I don't know what you think, Charles. I absolutely agree. He brings it every time. He does, and this is the third part of our third interview with Paul, the end of the trilogy. Yes. Wow, so we've done as many episodes as there have been Star Wars movies now, right? Of the main, the Skywalker saga, as they call it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes the skywalker saga we have not done any we should do paul Hirsch stories next um for spinoffs yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah it's, this is exciting i mean it's it's somewhat sad we, we hope we have paul back because we we get into some great stuff this week but yeah what a legend he really is and it's it's i guess he's the only person we've had on three times now so he's he's leading the charge there are people who are gonna have to McCory and uh, and uh, who else has been on twice? Lauren Balf has been on twice. Patrick has Patrick been on twice. Patrick Willems. Yeah, they're gonna have to try to up their game here. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a fun this is a fun one. Um, we do not convince him that Blowout is a good movie, sadly, but he does talk a little <laughs> bit more about De Palma, which is nice. But he he teases that there's a John Hughes movie that he teases and he gives the details on that we'd never heard of before, and it sounds awesome. Yes, it does sound awesome, and. Charles, you think you uncovered who he, which actor he was talking about? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that later. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about that idea. It's pretty fun. Uh, but uh, I did I did want to give some context. We talk about the Brian De Palma movie Obsession, and we talk about the third section of the movie that was never filmed. And I feel like we should uh, we should talk about that. And also he talks about the story of, of how he softened the last part of the movie in order for it to get released. Yes. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert when we talk about that, right? This is a spoiler alert. Um, so you want me to take it from here, Charles? Yeah, I guess first first obsession has two sections of the movie, right? Yes. It was written by Paul Schrader, who was, you know, a former film critic and then a screenwriter and one of the guys that these folks were hanging around with. Because you remember De Palma had Taxi Driver first and gave it to Scorsese. Yes, and, which you know. Paul Schrader wrote Taxi Driver, yes. So he wrote a script called Deja Vu, and it had three sections, one for each act, and the first section was in the past, the second section was in the present, and the third section was in the slightly distant future. I don't think it was too far in the future, but it was... But it actually took place in the future. Yes. Yeah, it was like set in the 80s or 90s when the movie was made in the 70s. Yes. So that section was just completely thrown out. They didn't film it, and um, Schrader has somewhat disowned the movie. I think you can see that those pages. There's a British region-free Blu-ray of Obsession that I think has those pages in the little booklet in the movie in right. the Blu-ray. But so we talk about that, and then the the ending, which now yeah, this is really we're really getting into spoiler territory. Well, I think we could maybe f- say it in a way that's like, uh, there's a shocking ending to the movie that is potentially objectionable, or I don't even know if it's potentially, it's pretty objectionable to, I think, most humans. Right. And they, in order to, the movie wasn't going to get released. Right. Because of this ending of the movie, and Paul came up with the idea, which he talks about in detail in his book, which you should absolutely buy, a long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. Get the book, hardcover, paperback now. It's an uh, audiobook, Kindle. Uh, he softened it. Uh, he, he gave it this kind of dreamy feel. Yes. So that it makes it feel like a dream at the end. And then that made it so that the movie could get released. Right. I think it's. I think that ending is bullshit. But yeah, you're right. I mean, if it, it was... <laughs> I think that it's sort of now more more objective. You can you can decide which one you think is is right. uh, really happening. But yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great movie. I mean, it's not my favorite De Palma movie, but uh, there's a, there's some great stories that De Palma tells in Noah Baumbach's De Palma documentary as well. Oh yeah, um, some really great ones. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was fun to hear. I mean, he's God. Hirsch has got De Palma stories for days. Yeah. Truly. So I know you're probably uh, chomping at the bit to do your, uh, you know, your your favorite part of the show. But before we do that, I wanted to just bring this up. One of our listeners, Melissa, sent us this video, and Melissa sent us a bunch of stuff over the years. And this is a really cool thing. It was a stunt man named Rick English, and he breaks down the motorcycle stunts of several movies, uh, most notably John Wick Three and Rogue Nation. Oh. In addition to some other movies like Skyfall, The Dark Knight, Terminator Two, and The Great Escape. 
But uh, he talks about the different stunts and, and what went into them. Uh, it's Most of the movies he didn't work on, but the one he actually did work on is Rogue Nation. So he tells some stories about Tom Cruise doing his own stunts and describes in detail how they did a lot of the motorcycle chase in Morocco. And at one point he said he was, uh, you know, driving on his motorcycle alongside Cruise and he was... He was looking at, he looked at his speedometer and Cruz was actually in front of him and he noticed that they were doing 130 miles an hour. Oh my so, God. <laughs> Cruz is actually doing that. So we'll include the video that Melissa sent us. We'll put it in our show notes. Uh, you can find in the episode guide on our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. Uh, it's a really fun video to check out. It's cool. It, the little crossover with Light the Wick and Light the Fuse, John Wick 3 and Rogue Nation are analyzed in this video. I love that. But really, uh, what I love more is giving my shout outs, Charles. So I just want to remind everybody that this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon. And everyone should check out his podcast, My Favorite Album, where he talks to a different musician, songwriter, actor, or filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by John B., as well as Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate advice for growing companies. And they want companies to know that they can consult with Real Estate Interest LLC, even if they are not looking to buy or sell. They help companies save and strategize, too. So get after it. Check them out. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, now please enjoy uh, Kevin Blumenfeld's criminally... uh well, it's 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 different. Okay, it's it's just the same. It's the plot theme. Enjoy Kevin's plot theme. <laughs> You brought up obsession before, and there's always been this theory that that missing section of the movie was a hindrance, and I think Schrader was pretty pissed about it. Um, do you have any feelings about that? Well, it's hard to know because we never shot it, you know. So, but you know, reading it, you think, well, the movie's over now. She discovers that he was her father, and you know, and then you go twenty years into the future, and there's. I forget what happens in that. I don't even remember what happens in the third section. It just seemed right. like the picture was already over, you know, to me. I mean. Do you agree with the softening of that moment of of making that the incest a kind of dream sequence? Yeah, nobody would touch it otherwise. But I, but if you had your druthers and it could go out any, any way and box office didn't matter and whatever. But it couldn't. Okay. <laughs> no. No, nobody would have seen it. Right. Right. I mean, maybe somebody would have dug it up and put it on the internet now, but no, it was a, you know, George Leto gave me credit for saving the movie. And, you know, I would say aesthetics aside, I did save the movie in terms of making it possible for it to be released. Right. I don't think Brian likes it and Schrader may not like it. I don't know how he feels about it. He doesn't like the movie anyway because we didn't include the, the third section. But yeah, do you think that's why you think that's why Schrader and De Palma never work together again? No, I don't know. You ever met Schrader? No, I see a grump. You ever met Brian? <laughs> We're trying to get Brian on this stupid podcast. You're no help. <laughs> you know, <it's... laughs> he didn't talk to me either. <laughs> but he but he gave a quote for the book. So are he you guys, he... like are you speaking again? No, I had dinner. I had uh, lunch with him in New York about two years ago. Okay. And it was very nice. He was very kind, and and um, it was great to see him. And it was just like old times. And uh, then subsequently, he wrote me um, an email saying that he had heard one of my podcasts, and he complimented he complimented me. He said, "You've become quite a good raconteur." <laughs> Which I thought was very nice. No, I'd love to see Brian again, but he lives in New York. I live here. And did you did you watch the documentary about him? Yeah. What'd you think? It's Brian. That's, yeah. that's him. Yeah. <laughs> that's who he is. That's who he was. Did you who he did is. you read his book? He wrote a book too. You know. Yeah, a I novel. was the novel. Yeah, yeah. I, I I read it and I thought, oh, this is just like watching another Brian De Palma movie. Yeah, it was nice in that regard. Yeah, you don't really get that many Brian De Palma movies anymore. Yeah, no. So. 
You you talk about De Palma's um, dailies. You say that they're like a jigsaw puzzle because the pieces only are designed to fit together in a certain pattern, which is like I love that kind of. I think Drew and I both love that kind of filmmaking, and uh, you know when one shot leads into another. You know some of our favorite directors work that way. Were there any other directors that were were like that that you worked with, or was was he really the only one who who delivered that way? Well, he's unique in terms of how visual he is, and in terms of his disdain for for dialogue. You know, he wants to communicate everything uh, through uh, visuals, and I think he's unparalleled in in some of the images that he's come up with, crews dangling at the end of a rope. And I saw somebody sent me a, a poster that had a collage of images from his movies. And I thought, yeah, he's really come up with some great images. Carrie splattered with blood. And, you know, I mean, so he, he comes up with great images. But um, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Oh, was he was, the only one? No, yeah. he's not the only one. Uh, Herbert Ross, who right. was a choreographer, watch his movies with an eye to that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the Sunshine Boys. He's got dialogue scenes that start, you know, uh, I remember one scene, I think it was uh, George Burns and uh, Richard Benjamin arriving someplace to have lunch. And it starts in the car and they get, or a taxi, they get out and they walk across the sidewalk and they go inside and they, and they go up the stairs and they come into the restaurant and over to the table. And it's timed perfectly so that the dialogue ends just at the cutting point. I mean, he, he's he got it all figured out perfectly so that right. the the timing is, is just, it's beautifully designed. And, you know, and if you look at his movies in terms of, from a choreographer's standpoint, how the actors are blocked in the scene, how they're arranged in the frame. And uh, I remember a scene in... in uh, Steel Magnolias, where the six women are walking along, or maybe it's five at that point, are walking along, and they enter frame on one side, and they exit frame on the other. And the dialogue is perfect, so that the first line of dialogue is by the first woman who comes in, and the last line of dialogue is by the last woman who goes out. So the whole thing is, takes place in one shot, but it never... It never lags, and it, you know it has a great beginning, has a great ending, and it was just like beautifully designed, and it's it's so simple that it, it that it's it's easy to miss it, right? You know, it just seems well, it seems like well, of course, you know, he he was he was really gifted in that way and underappreciated, I think his stuff. I think Sunshine Boys is still one of the funniest movies. You know, have you seen it? I no, I haven't. The 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 I actually if I should see more of his stuff. Yeah, I love uh, My Blue Heaven. I love uh, Footloose. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about My Blue Heaven. I went to visit. They were shooting in Long Beach or someplace. I, I went, drove down to see them, and I had done you know uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with Steve. So Steve invites me into his trailer, and he and Rick Moranis are playing cards. He said, come on, sit in, you know. And uh, we start playing, and it's $20. <laughs> I forget what we were playing. It was poker or something. And it was $20 each hand, you know. And I lost like three hands in like five minutes. And, you know, I said, sorry, guys. This is too rich for my blood. <laughs> you know? I, can't, I can't do this. You know? <laughs> I was looping Steve for Steel Magnolias uh, for Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and we went out to lunch uh, from where we were working, and we drove down to Melrose, and uh, we were looking for a place to park. It was in my car, and he was sitting next to me, and he says, over there, over there. And I said, no, that, that's illegal. He says, just park there. I'll pay the ticket. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I realized he and I live in different universes. <laughs> I don't think along those lines, you know. (laughs) But he's a lovely guy. Very nice. Very friendly. I was at a dinner party, and he was one of the guests. And he shows up with this young... uh, It was after his divorce from Victoria Tennant, I think was her name. Anyway, he shows up with this young woman, a young actress. And uh, we're sitting around the dinner table. And and, uh, she says, well, listen... uh, I have an early call tomorrow. I, I'm sorry, but we, we have to go. And 
and uh, he and she leave. I mean, we we hadn't finished dinner, and she was she and Steve leave the party. So everybody at the table was going, "What was that?" You know, <laughs> that's kind of odd. And uh, so about an hour later, we get the host gets a phone call. And Steve he says, "Can I come back?" <laughs> So he came back alone. He was he was having a good time, and he you know dropped her off and came back. And can we say who that actress was? Do you remember? I, I don't remember. Oh, okay, that's funny. <laughs> I was wondering about your when you you know there's a section of your book about your time where you were sort of just employed by Fox as kind of a. I mean, what what was your credit? You were a consultant, or I don't remember my title. But I was just wondering if there were any movies that maybe you worked on or assisted or helped shape that obviously you weren't given credit for, but sort of have have your stamp on it that people would maybe be surprised by. I can't say that to be true. Uh, I, I remember two projects in particular that I worked on. One was a picture called The Five Heartbeats, directed by Robert Townsend. And... Uh, they wanted me to go on the set. I don't know what they wanted him to do. Wanted me to do. They, so they, they wanted me to be on the set every day. I, I said, what am I going to do? Argue with him about where to put the camera? I mean, I'm not doing that. You know, forget it. I, I'm not going to do that. So I just worked, you know, away from the set and tried to help him. I remember I had conversations with him about uh, rewriting one of the scenes to strengthen the motivation for one of the characters, whatever he did, it, you know, it was like seemed arbitrary the way it was written. And I had come up with an idea that would justify what he was doing. And Robert said, what do you want me to do? Rewrite the scene? I said, yeah, you haven't shot it yet. You can, you know, so he, he didn't want to do that, you know? And, uh, so, you know, they, they muddled along and, uh, I forget if I told the story about the the screening in Oakland. Is that in the book? I'm not sure. Robert had directed this movie. You know, Robert had done Hollywood Shuffle, and he had uh, he had starred in it. And he was, you know, he he had sold this idea of the Five Heartbeats. You know, sort of like based on the Temptations or something. You know, singing group guys who you know came up together and they struggle with each other and you know and. Uh, Joe Roth thought he was making sort of a lighthearted comedy about a musical group, and Robert thought he was making The Godfather. So <laughs> the, the tone, the tone of it was much different from what you know. I don't think anybody had re ever read the script, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I think they okayed it based on Robert's pitch. You know, anyway, we have this cut. You know, we fly to Oakland uh, for a preview, and we're late getting there. And uh, the audience has been sitting in the theater for quite a while. And we get there and, and Robert comes out onto the stage and he's wearing a trench coat and a fedora, which is kind of his trademark at the time. And everybody bursts into applause. And he says, hi, I'm Robert Townsend. And he says, yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, want to welcome you. I directed this movie and, you know, hey, big, you know, excitement and everything. And I hope you have a great time, you know, big applause, you know, and the movie starts and we collect the cards. We're in the bus going back to the plane and Tom Sherrick, who was the head of marketing at the time, is looking at the results. And he said, this is the kind of scores you get if you had an audience of seven-year-olds, you know, the best movie I ever saw, you know, like 99%. <laughs> said it was the best movie I ever saw. So they went to Robert and they said, Robert, we're going to have another preview next week, but I'd like to ask you a favor. Please do not come out and address the audience beforehand <laughs> unless you can guarantee that you can be at every screening of every theater in the country. <laughs> So that was a memorable event. <laughs> and another time, they were they were shooting uh, Exorcist Three, and Peter William or William Peter, I forget which it is. But anyway, Blatty was directing, and he had decided he didn't like the guy who was playing one of the leads. I guess he 
I guess he was the devil, and he had locked him up. He was locked up in an, in some psychiatric prison or something, and he got impatient with the actor, and he fired the actor halfway through the picture and replaced him with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they opened the prison door, and now there's a new actor playing the same character, you know? So... Uh, it was such a mess. It was such a mess. I couldn't, you know. And the way I got involved was Joe Roth said to me, he says, we need somebody to cover the mix because Blatty can't be there. I'd like you to, you know, cover the mix for us, you know. So I said, okay. So I watched the picture and I thought, so I went to Joe and I said, listen, I wouldn't bother with the mix, you know. Don't, don't, don't even bother mixing the picture. Just ship it the way it is with the, temp track because to spend another penny on this would be a waste of money (laughs) so he says all right uh well why don't you see what you can do with it so i said okay you know so i go to the cutting room and vladdy is in there and he's pumping iron and he's like you know and i said hi i'd like to speak to you you know and they hadn't set me up that you know the thing about being a movie doctor is it all depends on how you're introduced into the situation. Right. Because unless it's done properly, it could blow up in your face. Yeah. And if, in this in this case, it blew up in my face. So anyway, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Blatty, but he has extremely light eyes, but they're not blue. They're not light blue. It's like, imagine uh, Paul Newman, but with brown eyes instead of blue. So they're like really light so they, you almost feel like you're looking at a lion's, a lion's eyes. They're like yellow and the most frightening pair of eyes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and, and he looked at me, and I forget what he said, but it's like, no way you're getting your hands on this picture, you know. So, yeah, that wasn't a fun job. <laughs> and, then, and then there was a picture directed by Marshall Herskovitz called Jack the Bear with Danny DeVito. And I had some ideas about that. And they didn't want to hear my ideas. They didn't, they, you know. So it's not, it's not a fun job, which is why I left. So Brian called, needed help on um, raising Cain, and I was thrilled to get out of there. Were you privy to any... Because uh, you, this was sort of during the John Hughes era of your life, and and you, you know, obviously were going to direct a picture of his. And were there any other sort of un, undeveloped screenplays that you saw from that period that you really liked or can remember being really fun? Because you know, the rumor is that he left behind all of these sort of screenplays that were never made. He had so many ideas. I don't know how many were fully realized as full screenplays, but. John used to walk around with a little notebook and a pen and he would write ideas constantly or things, you know, he'd he'd be writing constantly. And I've gotten sort of friendly with his son, not sort of, I've gotten friendly with his son, James, lovely man. We've done some appearances together. Uh, He's a journalist and he interviews me and we talk about his father's work. And uh, from what I understood, there are stacks and stacks of unproduced screenplays uh, that he left behind. There was one project that I really wanted to direct called Larry's Late for Life. And uh, I wanted to get, uh, who's that famous clown? Bozo? Not Bozo. (laughs) An actor who's a clown. He was in Full Moon with... uh, Marcel Marceau Marceau? No, uh, Bill, uh, I'll probably think of it after I get off with you guys. But anyway, he was a physical comedy, you know, he did physical comedy. And the, the premise for Larry's Late for Life is the guy can't get to work, physically cannot get to work. He lives in the suburbs outside Chicago. He's in advertising and he's working on a campaign for a bug killer. And he's got a presentation to bring to the office. And um, he's been up all night working on this thing and he comes down and he goes out to the garage to get in his car and the car is not there. 
And there's a note from his wife saying, my car's in the shop. I borrowed yours. You know, we talked about it. Or, you know, he had forgotten that he'd... And she says something like, I, I, or I lent my car to, to uh, Billy, who, who took it to school. So then he has to try to get... He, so he decides... <laughs> Somehow he gets locked out of the house. I forget the details, but he gets locked out of the house and he has to, he tries to break into the house by, there's a, there's a, uh, a window into the basement that's below ground in a kind of a concrete well that has a grating over it. So he has to lift up the grating and get into the little concrete well to try to force the window. And he can't force the window and the grating falls and now he's trapped in this little space outside <laughs> the house and he has to break in through the glass and then uh he figures that he he can take his he'll go to the high school to get the keys to the car and he'll use his son's bicycle to get to the school but this bicycle is hanging from a rack on the ceiling of the garage and he has to get up and of course he he gets the bike but he falls and you know, it's, it's like one physical difficulty after another and he rides the bike to school uh, and he sees the car and he gets he jumps off the bike he runs into uh, the school finds the class gets the son to give him the keys to the car he jumps in the car and he realized that he left the bike just behind so he gets out to move the bike and the door slams shut. Now the keys are in the car and he's locked out. <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> it's like that. It was like one thing. I mean, it was just, it was just one thing after another. And I just thought this, this thing is, it, it doesn't stop. And then he calls a cab and the guy shows up at the house and he gets in, uh, no, he calls a cab and he says, you know, take me to, he gives an address downtown Chicago and falls asleep because he's so exhausted from all this. So the cab driver says, you know, they're driving along and said, where are we going again? And he sees he's asleep. And he, so he leans over and he looks at his attache case and it's got his address on it. And he's, he takes him home. Because <laughs> it's got his home address on it. So he takes him and he says, we're here. And Steve pays and he jumps out and the guy drives off and he's still at his house. <laughs> So, uh, meanwhile, the, the campaign that he come up with is all about a roach writing a suicide note. You know, I can't go on living anymore, not with, you know, decon, whatever in the world. You know, it's a goodbye world. I'm giving up, you know. So they find this note and they think that he's committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was Larry's late for life. It was, it was great. It was wonderful. And uh, it never got made. So what happened? I mean, how far away, how far along did you get to in developing that? Well, what happened was when, you know, when Joe had agreed to hire me uh, and look for a project for me to direct, that was the deal when I came on. And during that time, they produced Home Alone. And Home Alone, they picked up and turned around from Universal, I think. And the picture blew up, made three hundred million dollars. So now, the 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 urgency was to shoot a sequel to Home Alone before Macaulay Culkin's voice changed. You know, so that was the focus. It was like we have to get Home Alone two going immediately. And uh, they had this other picture, Dutch. Dutch. Uh, was going to be directed by Peter Feynman, who was an Australian director who had directed Crocodile and Dundee and was friends with Rupert Murdoch. So Murdoch wanted Feynman for Dutch. And at that point, they weren't going to do anything with me because they were so busy with Home Alone 2. And then they had a picture called The Baby, which I think eventually got made, where it was sort of like the idea of Home Alone was where a kid foils criminals. Well, in this case, it was a baby yeah. foiling criminals. Baby's Day Out. Yeah, Baby's Day Out. Was a, yeah. There was one called The Bee that, that, that people wrote about from that time. Do you remember that at all, that Daniel Stern was going to direct? No. Where it was just a guy being menaced by a bee for a couple no. hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody could pull that off, it was John. I mean, he yeah. was like, 
he he was still like a miniaturist. He would take the smallest idea and then embellish, and you know, it's like Larry's late for life. You know, he take just build on this simple idea and all the various possibilities and permutations. You know. Anyway, guys. I'm running out of gas. <laughs> I know. All right. Well, please promise to keep in touch and um, let us know what you're up to. Likewise. And yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. It was a pleasure again. <laughs> bye, guys. Have a good one. All right. Bye. we go charles another one in the bag yep we did it every saga has to end or whatever they said about the skywalker saga (laughs) the paul hirsch saga so let's talk about this movie this john hughes movie that he was going to direct yeah larry's late for life and he says he wanted a clown named bill he couldn't remember the actor and we think he's talking about bill Irwin. yes who i've actually been seeing a lot lately because he's mr noodle on elmo's world (laughs) Uh, he was also in uh, My Blue Heaven, which I also watched recently. The uh, It's a Herbert Ross movie, isn't it? Yeah. It was based on the same story that was adapted for Goodfellas. Yes. And, and uh, I think it was Nora Ephron wrote it. Yeah. And she was with the guy who wrote uh, Goodfellas. What's his name? Spalegi, oh, right? Spalegi, yeah. The two of them were married, I think, at the time, or at least together. And they <laughs> he wrote Goodfellas with Scorsese and she wrote My Blue Heaven. So they make a fun double bill. Both came out in 1990. Yes. Um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, Bill Irwin is a small role in that movie. And if you see him, he has this great physicality to him. Uh, he was a, a very famous, uh, I guess, clown for many years, which I did not know. And when you see him as Mr. Noodle on Elmo's World, it's a, he's like a mute character and does all these physical things. And it's cool. So he would have... And I also, I didn't know this. He played Tars in Interstellar. Yes. The uh, robot character that's in Interstellar that's really cool. I saw some behind-the-scenes photos of him operating the the robot, which is really cool. Yeah, he's awesome. So he would have played that that lead role, which I feel like is a movie that could have been made in the not in the early '90s. Yeah, I mean, it could be made. I'm I'm still waiting for somebody to start uncovering those Hughes scripts and just making them now. Oh, I know. Uh, I, there's a script that I would love to I would love to make that I've tried to uh, I've read it. It's really great. And uh, it'll never happen, but I'm, I'm going to try to make it <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, it's a really cool John Hughes script. And uh, I have not been able to get a hold of whoever I need to get a hold of to try to make it. But I think it'd be really cool if people people should start making some of those. But I, they, maybe they don't want them to be made. Well, I mean, there there are binders and binders full of ideas and scripts. Yeah. And I mean, he fam- but his but his family, maybe they don't want maybe they just want it as an archive or something, you know, do they really want drill bit Taylor to be the last movie based on one of his scripts? Or <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe maybe this would help clear his name a little bit, you know, if some of these good ones <laughs> came out. But true, true. I'm sure a lot of them are owned by different companies as well. So. Who knows? Yes. Um, but yeah, that would it, it would be. I, I'm just waiting. Like we're starting to see some of the Prince stuff come out. Like we're gonna see. Oh, like some of the the songs, but yeah, Prince's archive. He's a whole archives, huge yeah. vault of stuff that never got released, right? Yeah, I think there's a double album coming out this summer, and they should at the very least release them as books or something, like the unproduced screenplays of John Hughes or something. You yeah, know? yeah, I would love that. Something like the the Napoleon book. The Kubrick Napoleon book. Yes. That, that would be awesome. Yeah. Also, speaking of Herbert Ross, I recently just watched Pennies from Heaven for the first time, and I'd never seen that. That's a really beautiful movie. It's very strange, but very cool. It has these awesome musical numbers and Steve Martin dancing. He's surprisingly very good at it. And Christopher Walken dance number is incredible. Yeah. I mean, he, he loves Herbert Ross, right? Yeah. Paul Hirsch talks about how he, you know, sings Herbert Ross's praises. So it's, I just, I had been meaning to watch that movie. And so I think there's still a few of his movies I haven't seen. So I need to check them out. I also loved hearing about uh, the exorcist three and (laughs) (laughs) what was going on there. (laughs) Yes. Um, I, I reckon there's a, there's a good shout factory Blu-ray that has both versions of the movie on it. Um, Of exorcist three. Yeah. Oh wow! It has the uh, the Legion work print, which is really cool. So, huh. very different movie. But I saw it for the first time a few years ago, and I was actually impressed with the movie. I thought it was good. Yeah, it is. I was surprised because I saw Exorcist two 
I don't know when that was, 10 or so years ago, and was not impressed with that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one is just insane. Exorcist 3 has, you know... It's really interesting, and the connections to the first movie are super interesting. Um, yeah. If, if Friedkin had actually come back, it would have been really cool. Um, I don't think Blatty is much of a director, but... Um, right. Yeah, it's good. So, anyway, check it out. All that chaos, that's, that's what it made. But... Yeah. Any other thoughts? Get Paul's book. It's so worth a read. Uh, you, you've got to uh, got to check it out. It's got he's got so many great stories. He's so funny. Um, a, a long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. It's on like we've said a million times. Hardcover, uh, paperback, Kindle, you know, audiobook, whatever. Get it, read it, devour it, enjoy it. It's wonderful. It has chapters about both the first Mission Impossible and Ghost Protocol because he edited both. Uh, it's definitely worth your time. Also, I've, we've said this in recent weeks, and we'll say it again. The anniversary of Mission Impossible 1 is coming up, so Fathom Events is bringing the movie back to cinemas nationwide on May 16th, 17th, and 19th only, and it includes the movie and a featurette called Mission Catching the Train. You can get tickets, find out participating locations at fathomevents.com. You and I are going. It's going to be awesome. Yes. Can't wait. We're going to be vaccinated. I got my first dose already. I'll have my second before then. So excited. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to be in a theater. And, um, you know, Charles and I are looking forward to, to seeing what City Walk, how City Walk has changed over the months. Oh, yeah. What's new in terms of food offerings. Um, if you see us, please stop us. I think we're pretty identifiable even in our masks. But um, maybe we'll post which show we're going to um, before maybe. that. Maybe. Charles doesn't want to get mobbed. <laughs> Um, but I also just want to remind people that they can subscribe to our Patreon, which is super cool. And we have a lot of fun episodes coming up. We have new episodes every week. In addition to the main episodes, we have commentaries. We have all uh, week, monthly Skype chats, whole bunch of fun stuff. Um, which by the way, we've got to do our John Wick commentaries soon. We do. We do have to do those. That'll be fun. And what else, Charles? Uh, so you go to patreon.com forward slash light the fuse. Uh, if you can't do that and you want to support us, you can go on our T Public page. We've got a bunch of great shirts. We've got a Luth Scuba Luther shirt, um, and we're gonna two have Scuba Luther shirts. Two Scuba Luther shirts. So you can do that, and you know if you can just rate and review and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast, that helps us out hugely. Uh, every little bit helps, and um, we don't want to have commercials on this show. So please. If you can support us any way you can, it would be a huge help. And Charles, you have some shout outs to give too, right? I do. And I also want to say stay tuned to our Twitter account at Light the Fuse Pod for the date and time of our live tweet of Mission Impossible 1. It will be a hashtag mission watch party for the ages, the 25th anniversary of the first movie. We're so excited. I also just want to say a thank you to our new intern, Adam Bumis. Uh, Adam's been helping us out with some archiving stuff and everything. So thank you so much to Adam. I also want to say thank you to our production assistant, Abby Smith, and to our mixer and editor, Luke Burson, and to our music man himself, Kevin Blumenfeld. I want to say thank you to you, Drew Taylor, <laughs> because you're awesome. And I also want to give a very special thank you to Jacob Ballard, who's been with us for a long time now. Jacob is an awesome contributor on our Skype chat. So a big thank you to him. This episode would not be possible without you, Jacob. And I think that's about it for me. Okay, cool. Well, until next week, do we know what next week is? No. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, it'll be a surprise to us as much as it will be to the listeners. But we will be back. Uh, yeah, actually, we, we, had, you know, we had a whole lot of programming set up for the release of Top Gun Maverick. But now that's been delayed. We're reorganizing a little bit and we're gonna it's gonna be something great for the twenty fifth anniversary next week of Mission Impossible One and uh and beyond. We've got some great stuff for Light the Wick. But uh we've got things in the works. Things are in the works. Okay. Okay, good. You're part of that. You know, you got the some things in the works too. I'm tr I'm trying. I can only send so many emails out, Charles. But <laughs> yes, we will be back next week and we hope you are too. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, 
and email us questions or comments at lightthefusepodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.